All right, everyone, welcome to Roundtable One of the Science of the Rocky Inner Title. This is the first in a series of roundtable discussions on tide pools, and it's hosted by USC Sea Grant and Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. So before we begin, let's see if this works. It's not progressing. Next. So before we begin, I just want to go th um, through some um, features in Zoom, if you're not familiar with it. So we're going to have some amazing panelists speaking tonight. Um, and we urge everyone to ask questions. And to do that, um, you can use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. So if you hover down, if it's not there, um, there's a Q&A feature to ask questions. You can also raise your hand and um, one of the panelists or, or hosts will get back to you. Um, you can use the chat box, which is on the left side of raise your hand to ask C Grant or Cabrillo questions, or if you're having technically or technical difficulties, um, you can also ask us there. Um, and then please note that the roundtable discussion is being recorded so that we can share this with um, a larger audience after. And so with that, I just wanted to introduce um, Phyllis Griffman. She's the Associate Director of USC Sea Grant um, to kind of spearhead into the panelist discussion. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all. This is a quite a good crowd. Thank you all for taking time out of your evening to join us tonight. Um, this is the first of three roundtables on tide pool use. And on behalf of Sea Grant, I welcome you. Um, we respectfully acknowledge that we live, work, and recreate on the land of the Tongva, Gabrielino, and Chumash peoples, and wish to express our gratitude and respect for the elders, past, present, and emerging. We honor those indigenous peoples who have been living and working, respecting and caring for this land at the interface between land and ocean from time immemorial. The changes in human uses of tide pool habitats that we've seen this spring and summer are profound and complex. It's enormously valuable to learn about the ecosystems and the habitats themselves and about the current volume of take, the impacts of that take on organisms and fragile species, and about their capacity to recover. Today's roundtable will focus on what we know about nearshore habitats today from scientists who have long studied these special places. According to state law, our coast belongs to everyone and permits access to all. It's thus equally important to understand the dimensions of human use, which are also complex and varied. It's important to remember that the people visiting tide pools are not a homogeneous, either in their demographics or their purposes. In our current strange, crazy time, many people are coping with food insecurity and hunger and this is likely a factor related to increased human take. While much of this take is legal and within the regular, regulatory outlines set forth by state fish and game agencies, some is not. Whether the harvesting is taking place inside the boundaries of marine protected areas or in areas where it is permissible subject to size and bag limits, we need to understand long-term effects. In today's roundtable and in two upcoming sessions, We'll bring experts to build upon one another's knowledge um, in science and policy and education. And we want to provide a platform for you to ask questions and share ideas. We're very happy um, to partner with Wrigley, with the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. And with that, I'll introduce Chris Lynn McCarran, who's the director of the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. The Cabrillo Marine Aquarium is a division of the Department of Recreation and Parks for the City of Los Angeles. And we're incredibly proud uh, to host this event in partnership with USC Sea Grant on this very important topic. We, as mentioned previously, we have an incredible panel of experts for tonight's event, and we greatly appreciate them lending their time and their expertise. The aquarium wants to extend our appreciation to USC Sea Grant for their partnership in this series. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight uh, for the start of this part series where we begin by discussing the importance of our local tide pools. We hope you find this discussion valuable. I know we will. And 
we hope that you will join us for the two additional events on this topic that are upcoming. And with that, I would like to introduce Cabrillo Marine Aquarium's very own Dr. Julie Passarelli, who will be moderating tonight's program. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thanks, Chris Lynn. And thank you to um, Chris Lynn and Phyllis for your support. And thank you to everybody who's joined us tonight. Um, before we get started, I would also like to thank and acknowledge Linda Chilton from USC Sea Grant and Jim DePompe, our programs director at Cabrera and Aquarium for all their hard work on putting this event together. Um, as, as Phyllis mentioned, the focus of these panels is to address the, the recent activity in the tide pools along the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And this is a three-part series. Uh, the first panel, tonight's panel, will be about the science and what we know about the rocky intertidal habitat, why this habitat is important, and what changes we have seen over time. The science is solid and ongoing, and it's important to understand that data are used to inform decision making. The second panel will be on August 26th and will be about management, policy, and enforcement in the Rocky Intertidal. And the third panel will be on September 9th and will be on the intersection of people in the Rocky Intertidal. More information on both those panels can be found on the Cabrera Aquarium and USCC Grants websites. Um, I also feel it's important to mention that if you see any inappropriate activity in the tide pools, the best thing to do is to call CalTIP. Um, the number is 888-334-CALTIP. This number is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Also, um, I would also like to mention Cabrera Aquarium is digitizing our tide pool walk orientation presentation as a video. And this vid video will be able to be used by educators or anybody really wanting to learn more about the animals and the tide pools. So look for that on our website soon. So tonight, we are so lucky to be able to hear from these scientists who have studied the Rocky Intertidal extensively and how it has changed over the last few decades. The viewers of this webinar, have, will have, you will have the opportunity to ask them questions about the ecology, um, the changing rocky, rocky shore ecosystems and human influences on this habitat. Um, as mentioned before, you can type your questions in the Q&A feature and we'll get to as many questions as we have time for. But if you've called in, there's a link in the RSVP uh, Google Doc that you can also submit your questions. So we have a variety of expertise on our panel and I'm going to highlight the background of all four and then we'll get into the discussion. So the first is, is Steve Lee. He's a, a, a marine and freshwater biologist with over 25 years of experience researching a variety of habitats, including the subtitle and rocky intertidal. He is an expert in the niche, near shore marine flora and fauna of the West Coast and for 20 years has helped manage a long-term rocky intertidal monitoring program with sites spread across the California coastline. Steve now applies his breadth of knowledge and experience to the Sonoma Ecology Center's research program, working to improve conditions in the local habitats and also works as a contract ecologist for the National Park Service. Steve spent most of his career working in academia, including five years at UC Santa Cruz and over 20 years at UCLA's Department of Environmental Health Sciences. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. Uh, next, we have um, Dr. Suzanne Lawrence Miller. She is the Director Emerita of the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. She worked with architect Frank Geary to develop the aquarium, which opened in 1981, and she also led a major ex aquarium expansion completed in 2004. Her scientific work focused on the ecology, biomechanics, and long-term population changes of seashore animals, including 30 years of annual surveys of intertidal organisms on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Dr. Uh, Lawrence Miller received a bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley and a PhD from the University of Washington. Thank you, Suzanne, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Alan Miller is a professor emeritus from California State University, Long Beach, retired in 2010 after 36 years of service. He taught several field ecology courses, believing that students learn best and improve their creativity when actively engaged in group and individual research projects. I can attest to that. 
These field courses also involve students in assisting Cabrumen Aquarium to conduct counts of abalone, sea urchins, and sea stars on the Palos Verdes Peninsula over a 30-year period. Scientific studies include marine molluscan diversity and nutrient contributions of fishes to the shallow water kelp and coral reef communities. Dr. Miller received his bachelor degree from Stanford University and a PhD from the University of Oregon. Thank you, Alan, for joining us. Um, Dr. S Steve Murray uh, is retired from the position of interim provost and vice president for academic affairs at California State University Fullerton in 2012. He previously served as Dean of the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics and was a member of Fullerton's biology fac faculty for 41 years. He is a coastal marine ecologist and has published numerous papers and reports on topics such as invasive seaweeds, marine herbivory, long-term changes in intertidal populations and communities, human impacts on coastal systems, and the effectiveness of marine protective areas in urban settings. Dr. Murray was appointed to the inaugural Federal Advisory Committee on Marine Protected Areas for the United States Departments of Interior and Commerce and was an original member of the Marine Life Protect Protection Act's master plan team and co-chaired the South Coast Region Science Advisory Team. Dr. Murray received his bachelor's and master's degree from UC Santa Barbara and his PhD from UC Irvine. Thank you all again for, for joining us all tonight. We really appreciate all of, you, all of your expertise. So with, with the underlying theme of importance and the rocky intertidal habitat and change over time, um, the first up and the first question um, goes to Steve Lee. So uh, there's everybody. Hi, Steve. So if you can unmute yourself. Um, so you, you've been studying uh, the rock inner tidal for many years. You've been studying communities and different habitats along the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Um, my first question to you is about community ecology. And just so everybody's aware, community ecology is the study of multiple species in an environment. Um, in the tide pools, many people harvest the California mussel for various reasons. Um, can you discuss the importance of mussels in the intertidal community and the impacts to the community if they are lost? Sure. Uh, so what I'd probably like to do is just kind of go back to your question about the importance of the intertidal communities in general before I launch into that, which is to say that these communities are what's so unique about them is 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 the is just how much diversity there is within within a relatively small space. The, these are crunched between land and sea, and the tides come in and the tides go out. And, the, uh, and as that happens, um, it creates different regimes within, within the, the shoreline where some areas are submerged uh, for, uh, uh, for, or actually they're, they're uh, exposed to the air for a longer period of time. And, uh, and other parts of that habitat are exposed for, uh, for less time. And then the way with the, with the waves constantly crashing on them, the things that live there have to be really durable. And every single little aspect of the rock as it's angling against the way the waves are crashing creates different microhabitats as you go from one very small place to another spot just right very, very close to it. And so the overall, the overall habitat means that there's just a, there's a lot of different Niche, niche habitats there, uh, where the conditions that within you know within just a few feet of each other can be so strikingly different that it allows the different sorts of organisms to specialize within within each one of those different habitats within that short amount of space. And so what you end up with is just an extreme amount of diversity within these areas and really unique uh, species doing really unique things. And so, and then you know the that because some species can handle being emerged for longer period of time than others, uh, maybe uh, they can't make it and stay out as far as uh, up on the intertidal as some of the other organisms. And so, for example, mussels can only make it in, uh, to, to be a certain height above. So they end up, uh, they have a limit to their distribution. And then, and then, 
everything above there is sort of uh, free sort of from, from, uh, 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 from muscles being there. And then uh, sea stars are things that eat muscles and they can only go up so far. So the, the different species interactions layer on top of the different, um, you know, the different niches that are there. And it just creates this, this mosaic of different, uh, uh, different, you know, diversity within the different area that, um, that is really unique. Um, and so that's, and so mussels specifically are a species kind of like a, in the forest you have without, if you didn't have the trees, you wouldn't have all the species that live, that live in the forest. And mussels are, are like that too. Mussels are what we call an ecosystem engineer where the presence of, of that species there and the way that their shells, um, you know, form together and create little pockets of, of space in between them, they create the habitat for a tremendous number of other species to live within in the same way, like I said, the trees are in the ocean, the way the kelp forests create the habitat for lots of other species to occur there within the different, you know, protective places. And so mussels just harbor a tremendous amount of, of, um, of species within the mussel beds uh, in the spaces between them, because as those wave cra waves crash on the shore, there's a lot of species that are protected within the mussel beds from the forces of the waves and also from the different predators that are there. So the architecture of a mussel bed means that with a really big thick mussel bed, there could be something like over a hundred species living, other types of species living within, within the mussel beds. As you get uh, mussel beds that aren't quite so large and aren't, aren't quite so thick, then the number of species uh, might uh, just uh, diminish a little bit. But mussels are just one of those species that, that really um, create a lot of habitat for lots of other species to live there. Um, and so we've been monitoring uh, the Palos Verdes Peninsula as well as actually lots of other places around Southern California and the West Coast. Uh, Steve Murray will probably talk more about that as well uh, for you know, the last 30 years. So sites were set up at White Point, which is one of the you know, places that's the focus of this discussion uh, with all of the activity that's happened there. That site was a monitoring site was set up in, in 1992 at that site. And we've been monitoring it every spring and fall ever since there and tracking the changes in the species that are there, such as the mussels and the barnacles and the, and the rockweeds and things like that, as well as, the, um, as, well as uh, surf grasses and the little, the large uh, limpets that are there. And so, and so that kind of monitoring program where you have data and you have somebody that, especially when they're the same people that stick around for so long, like I did, you end up seeing these observations and you know, notice the changes that happen over time. Um, and, and so we've seen a lot of changes that have happened over time through, through, through the, through the years at, at White Point and at, and at all the, all the other sites too, and along the West Coast. And there's been, there have been lots of changes that have occurred on the coast. Uh, but with respect to mussels specifically, um, mussels have, you know, in the early, in the 70s and before, mussels in, in this area used to be a lot, uh, a lot thicker and taller and, and, and big, more biomass. And therefore the, you know, the communities they would, they would harbor within them were, were, were larger too. Uh, but mussels have been declining through the years in, in Southern California and on the Palos Verdes Peninsula and Orange County specifically. Um, I guess I could share a screen just to show, I think it might be useful to, uh, to show uh, some of this just as an example. I don't have to, I'm not, I didn't prepare a huge PowerPoint for this, but, um, but let's see if this comes up here. Sounds good. And if I, so you guys let me know when my screen is visible. Okay, we can see it. Is it working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is just a, a, a kind of a typical mussel bed and you can see, you know, the mussels create structure and that's all I'm really trying to show in this. And in this case, you have mussels and then, then the whiter little things that are whiter in color are, are um, another like a bar goose barnacle called polycipes. And then you can see some sea anemones that are growing down toward the lower section of the picture. But, um, but like I said, that's a nice thick mussel bed. And, and in actuality, let me try to, well, I'll just go to the next, um, the next slide, slide here to show you that this is an example of when we first started collecting data at this site and when we set up these plots that were focused on the mussel communities there, 
you can see how thick in a nice fall of 1997 this particular mussel bed was in this plot. This is the exact same piece of rock. We have little bolts marking the corners. And so we have we're looking at the exact same you know, piece of, of rock in the same mussel area uh, across the two. And so you can see, obviously, by, by you know, 2018, the mussel bed looks a lot different. So this is something that's been happening over Southern California and in Palos Verdes Peninsula in general. I'll just show another, another slide here. This is this, a similar set of photos from a site just down the, down the way at Point Furman, um, at, right out from Cabrillo there at the aquarium. Uh, we set this site up in fall of 1999, and this was what the what the muscle bed looked like when we started monitoring it. And then you can see by and actually this is photo was from the spring of 2008, but that muscle bed started to decline and uh, and thin out um, by 2005 or something like that. And so by 2008, it's it's it was almost completely devoid of mussels, and and that's continued through to this day. And so we see these changes. I, I could also show additional photos. These are older photos that were taken um, back in the 1970s, um, you know, showing what some parts of the White Point area used to look like. Um, and then I'll, I'll just go back a little bit here. I know it's hard to scroll through all these things, but this is what, you know, White Point looks like today um, as we see it today. And, and one of the things I wanted to point out was that when we've been monitoring this site for so long we, and we're there at all the best low tides, other people, just like that's happening now, learn about those low tides too. And, you know, and this, is, this picture was taken at Point Furman, but this is pretty commonly what we've, what we've always seen at White Point. And, and while this phenomenon that we're experiencing now with this increased pressure is definitely new, and I'm sure it's very different than what's happened in the past. It's actually not new. Um, we've seen some really amazing observations happening there throughout the years with, um, with people uh, harvesting quite a lot of things there. Um, we've seen people just going through with buckets, collecting cockles, these little bivalves that live in the cobbles. Um, we've seen people with, again, buckets harvesting limpets. I've seen a, a saw a lady going through and just popping urchins one after the other and slurping out the insides. I've seen a person with waving a knife standing waist deep in with khaki pants on in a in the tide pool. And I asked him what he was doing. He was clearing the the egregia, this kelp species, away because that was his favorite fishing hole for opali. And so, um, we just this is not a new thing. These things have been going on for a, quite a long time. And I would say that of all the sites in, that I've ever experienced in, in Southern California or elsewhere, White Point has probably has the highest level of unregulated take and pr uh, harvesting pressure and, and just human impacts generally than any other site that I know about on the West Coast. But I'll just say, finish with, and I know my time is, is up, but which is that even, even yet, we still see these, this, these surprising amount of diversity there. If you look down deep into the cracks and crevices, we continue to see, you know, all of these little, even including some rare species, including we've seen black abalone there in, in, in places, which are a species that's trying to make a comeback. So, so even with all of that, the diversity there continues and hopefully we can uh, manage the site uh, and other areas uh, henceforth to make sure that diversity continues. Thanks, Steve. Um... I, I think it's so important for people to, to know that uh, even though a mussel is a single species, they create a huge community and, and removing mussels also removes habitat for many other species. So um, thank you for that. And I know you and I've talked over the years at Point Furman and, and you, sh you show me the bolts and you show me the pictures that you said there used to be a huge mussel bed here and it's just, it's gone. Um, and that's, yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, next up, let me get my screen down. Okay, next, um, next up is, is Suzanne. Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you for joining oh. us. Um, you, so you've been studying um, Palos Verdes as well for many years, but I'm a, I'd like you to, to talk a, a little bit about, of course, your experience um, 
at the aquarium and um, uh, the, your, your research that you've done, both with Alan and yourself, but if you could talk um, also specifically about populations of specific species. So population ecology is a single species and um, many of us are aware of the extreme decline of the black abalone population in Southern California. And um, uh, can you discuss how this happened, lessons learned, and how to avoid going in the same direction uh, with other species? Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, yeah, as far as my, my time at Cabrillo, um, when I came there, it was all, already a very thriving educational center, and, um, and the um, museum at the time, and later the aquarium that we developed, um, we really uh, considered to be an augmentation of the real classroom, which is the outdoor classroom. The tide pools at Cabrillo Beach, the sandy beaches, the open ocean, all of that. Um, but the uh, rocky seashores uh, in particular, uh, uh, as, as Steve mentioned, can be incredibly rich in animal and plant life. And also they're, at low tide, they're relatively easy to get to and can be really wonderful to explore. In the tide pools on rocky shores, you can find almost all the biggest subdivisions in the, in the evolution of animal life on Earth. Uh, the, these uh, usually the, the so-called uh, lower animals like anemones, clams, snails, crabs, and much more. Um, children love to explore the little creatures in tide pools, and scientists also study rocky shores quite intensively to explore such things as ecological processes, as, as Steve was talking about, uh, behavior, biomechanics, and, and even things like the potential for medical applications. Tide pools historically, of course, have also been a, a source of food for people. The edge of the ocean tends to concentrate food and other not nutrients to support the growth of organisms. Um, uh, with plankton and nutrients brought in by waves and tides, and then um, fertilized by upwelling from deeper waters, and also even runoff from land. Of course, some of that runoff can also be uh, detrimental. And as Steve mentioned, the animals and plants are incredibly, on the shore, rocky shore, are incredibly hardy in a lot of ways, having to withstand heavy surf and drying and extremes in temperature but they're also really vulnerable to predation and other forms of destruction, especially by human beings. Most are really no match for determined human collectors. And as Steve mentioned, most are also limited to pretty narrow bands on the seashore. Uh, and um, a, a number of the, the intertidal species. There really are not more of the same things down below the tide to move up and take the place of harvested species, which many people don't realize. They think that, oh, there'll be more coming in, you know, more, there's more where that came from. Um, and also um, new larvae coming in to settle on the seashore, uh, that can sometimes be very sporadic, sometimes uh, years, even decades in between big settlements for, for some species. Uh, I, I should mention also that Southern California, uh, Rocky Shore life is also particularly diverse because it's got both the, the very abundant and rich Northern cold water fauna represented and a lot of tropical species too, such as cowries that make their way cowrie snails that make their way up into Southern California. But in terms of the black abalone, um, I'll focus on that one because it's a particularly sad case. The black abalone, which is, um, I'll show this here, uh, my low tech version, this black abalone. Um, it's one of uh, seven different species uh, in, that are native to California. And nowhere else in the world uh, can you find so many large abalone, uh, which will range from like, well, the, the red abalone can, can get up to 12 inches long, and the smallest one in our area is the black abalone, which will get to be about the size of the, the palm of my hand, maybe six or seven inches uh, in, in size. 
they used to be the easiest ones to find, the black abalone, because they're the ones uh, that are definitely intertidal animals. They live in the middle and uh, lower rocky shore and sit there uh, waiting to capture drift kelp, which is its favorite food, um, uh, from the, uh, the kelp forests that um, are just offshore from rocky shores in Southern California. Uh, Native Americans long harvested black abalone for food and, then all, and also used their, their shells for implements and decorations. Um, the most important non-human predator of abalone in, in California, sea otters, nearly became extinct after two centuries of overhunting for their fur when old world hunters started to come into the area to, um, to do uh, commercial level um, harvesting throughout the world. Uh, after the sea otter's demise, um, down to very small remnant populations in um, off Point Sur, uh, abalone over time became super abundant. There were stories of ab black abalone just piling on top of each other out on the, on the Channel Islands. The black abalone themselves, uh, and because of the superabundance of abalone, um, commercial harvesting then later on became a, a big industry in California. The black abalone themselves were not, not of much interest uh, commercially um, until the bigger subtitle abalone species became depleted. The subtitle ones um, had lighter, more tender meat. Mm -hmm. Uh, they became over harvested and um, and at that and then uh, by the late 1960s um, some of the harvesters began to focus on black abalone instead um, including a lot of um, poaching especially in this in this urban area that we, we live in on um, so by the by the early 70s the uh, harvesting of black abalone really went up and um, by the mid 70s, uh, Cal Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game at the time, uh, banned abalone harvesting on the Palos Verdes Peninsula because the pressure had become so heavy. Um, Alan and I moved to this area in about that time in 1974. And at that time, it was still relatively easy to find black, green, and red abalone um, on our seashores here. At Abalone Cove, there were even a couple of places where we saw abalone kind of stacked on each other, like out at the islands. Um, abalone Cove had been a private beach club, but uh, was scheduled to open to the public in 1975. So we decided to study this area along with some other sites to try to measure the impacts of changes in public access on creatures like abalone, and echinoderms, and, and a few other species. Um, we involved lots of um, aquarium volunteers and college students in these efforts over the years. On that first survey at Abalone Cove in 1975, we counted almost 120 black abalone in our 30 quadrats that we laid out in the middle and low intertidal. And that's an average of, of about four abalone per square meter in this um, region. Uh, in reality, they're not spread out four per square meter. They tend to occur in clusters in the microhabitats that they prefer. Portuguese Band, another uh, private beach club, averaged about three per square meter. And at our Point Vicente site, which requires a really long trek over rocks around the point, we found the highest numbers about um, up to almost seven per square meter that first year. But even out at Point Vicente at this very remote site, uh, in addition to all the sites, we saw plenty of evidence of um, abalone poaching. Um, usually the, when you see a large overturned rock, recently overturned rock, that's a good indication that somebody had been going through there, mostly looking for abalone, sometimes it's for octopus. Um, and if, if, that, if we found those when there hadn't been any really heavy surf or storms coming through, then we pretty much could tell it was poaching. Over the next 12 years of our survey, the numbers of black abalone dropped almost to zero at all of the locations. 
uh, whether they were easy to get to or not. And in the two decades since then, the sightings of black abalone have been extremely rare. Um, at Abalone Cove, um, the black abalone, after two years, dropped to about half of what we had first seen. Um, then the decline slowed for a little while because the city of Rancho Palos Verdes um, declared a marine reserve there and the lifeguards started kind of monitoring uh, visitors to curtail unlawful collecting. But over time, uh, they declined at all sites. Uh, so uh, almost, going almost to zero. But in addition to counting the abalone, we measured their sizes to get an idea of the, uh, the population age structure, structure and, and how much recruitment was taking place. Um, over those 12 years of decline, the majority of the black abalone that we, that we saw were still at least five centimeters long, which is kind of the minimum size uh, at which they begin to become, um, join the, the breeding uh, population. Um, that's at about three years old. But uh, in a very short time, uh, the, the, the very young abalone, the ones that are about two centimeters of le or less that had just set settled within the last year, uh, they fell to zero um, within the first six, six years. They, they just declined very rapidly, much more rapidly than the decline of the population as a whole. Um, as an example, in the first six years of the survey, we counted 233 young, and then in the following 11 years, in, in, in all these surveys, we found only 33 um, newly settled abalone. Abalone are broadcast spawners. They release their eggs and sperm into the water, and when there are not enough spawning individuals within close proximity of each other, uh, in the case of abalone, maybe two meters at most, uh, reproduction just is not successful. Uh, and then at the, towards the end of this 12 year period too, in 1986, uh, the, the final blow came when an epidemic disease called the withering foot sy syndrome hit um, abalone in Southern California, starting at the islands, um, but eventually reaching mainland and, and moving up and down the coast. Um, our minimal remnant Palos Verdes population, which was already very small, dropped to zero in 1987. And um, since that year, the black abalone uh, have been extremely rare sightings. They, sometimes, they do still occur, but very, very rare. Um, and um, in 2009, it actually became listed as a critically endangered species by, by the U.S following the white abalone, which was the very first marine invertebrate uh, declared that. Um, in terms of other, um, uh, of the changes of habitat over time, um, there are a lot of other changes that occur, as Steve mentioned too. Um, some of those changes were actually positive. Uh, for instance, after the offshore sewage outfalls were cleaned up and kelp forests began to grow again, um, uh, things like sea urchins became more abundant. That should have helped abalone, but by that time they were so scarce that um, that didn't help them. Um, <clears throat> and of course, with uh, the uh, changes in, in climate, um, our Southern California rocky shores are beginning to look more like the shores of Mexico where there's um, just not as much abundance of sea life. You can find a lot of diversity if you look hard, but, uh, but it just does not look as rich as it does as you go uh, farther up the coast. Um, so, um, uh, in terms of abalone, um, all of these things um, had an effect, I'm sure, but um, our observations showed that it was um, human predation <clears throat> that really caused the, <clears throat> the, the demise of black abalone on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. <clears throat> and they became unable to reproduce uh, successfully uh, because their numbers had started to drop so low. So that's it for, it's a sad story, but. Yeah. Uh, 
I know, I, I know we only see like one or two when we go out now and um, if they're, if it's just, they're alone, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, leading yes. very lo lonely lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, thank you, Suzanne. Um, I know, yeah, you, you saw a, a, a huge chain in, in a single population over your, your time um, studying the Palos Verdes Peninsula. So I'm going to, to move on to Alan. Alan, um, when, um, when, whenever I, I think of you and all the classes that I've taken with you, I, know, I think of recruitment, recovery, and Suzanne mentioned a little bit, and Steve too, I think about larvae and um, recovery or settlement. Um, so I, and I always think of you, of course, as species diversity, and you were the community ecologist at Cal State Long Beach for many years. Um, can you talk a bit about varying species abundance and um, what happens if, if a single species declines in the inner tidal? How long, what's your impression of how long would it take for a species to recover and what factors might affect that recovery if, if it could recover at all. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Yeah. <laughs> so this, uh, what I'm going to mention is an offshoot of what uh, Suzanne and the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium doing their Peninsula Shore Watch study that uh, Julie and uh, Banked Allen from Cal State Long Beach are continuing in those efforts. So the changes that we saw, we actually quantified a number of changes in populations. But before I get to those, I want to mention another change, an important change that took place, but we did not quantify. And that was the sandcastle worm. And I don't have a picture of those little things. But they, uh, they're tube worms, and they build their tubes out of sand grains. And they build them in crevices. And in the intertidal along Palos Verdes Peninsula, the sandcastle worms started taking over crevices. Now, this means there's no space for a young abalone to find shelter, or sea urchins even. So that, that phenomenon extended up the coast. Uh, some of Joe Connell's people reported on Phragmatopoma, the sandcastle worm, doing the same thing, occupying a lot of space in the inner tidal. Steve earlier mentioned that mussels occupy space, and this causes an increase in small animal and plant diversity. The apex predator, the top predator in the inner tidal, now, ignoring sea otters, is the sea star, the ochre sea star, Pisaster ochracius. This was one of the species that we monitored over our 30 plus year uh, censusing. We also monitored another echinoderm, the sea star, the bat star. And what we found was that we had reasonable numbers. I won't get into the little minor, minute details, but we had reasonable numbers of sea stars, 40 to 60 in our 30 square meter uh, quadrats in the mid and early 1970s. And then there was a wasting disease that took out most of the individuals of the sea stars. And the bat star, which I have sort of a picture of, multicolored, really pretty little guys, uh, the bat stars went to one or two in our census areas and stayed that way. They've never really come back in any abundance. Bat stars feed on detritus. Um, they'll plop out their stomachs onto the rock and digest whatever's there. Uh, they have a subtidal population. We don't have information on what their subtidal population, uh, and what happened there in the 
late 70s, early 80s with this disease or what's there now. Don't have that information. Pisaster, the ochre star, feeds on uh, mussels primarily and they actually are able to regulate the lower distribution of mussel beds. Now this picture was taken about 1978 at uh, Abalone Cove. It, nowhere does it look like this anymore there. The Pisaster, the ochre stars were also heavily impacted by this disease. The disease is associated with an increase in sea surface temperatures. Now, the Pisaster, the ochre star, remained low in abundance through the 1980s until the later years when we started to see small individuals and large individuals back in our sample areas. This suggested that the large ones were coming from the subtitle, but that we were also getting recruitment of the young ones. So there we had a species that went down in abundance in the early 1980s, about 10 years later started to come back to relatively high numbers. Then 2013, up in the Gulf of Alaska, a heat wave in the ocean occurred. This heat wave migrated down, all the way down to Mexico. We had elevated sea surface temperatures and subsurface temperatures from late 1913 into, what did I say, 1913? <laughs> yeah, right. 2013 into 2016. That period was associated with another disease impact on echinoderms not just sea stars, but also apparently in some places on sea urchins. The sea star population diminished down to nothing in a couple of the sample sites, but has since come back with some reasonable numbers. Julie can probably speak to those since I've not been involved, but they have started to come back. Sea stars keep mussels from occupying all of the bare space. If other things weren't regulating the mussels, it would be similar to those pictures that Steve showed, where there's mussels everywhere. And that inhibits some other critters from having space to live and survive, like limpets, um, chitons, things like that. So the sea stars have an important part in the inner tidal flux. Moving on to sea urchins. Sea urchins, as Suzanne mentioned, started to go increasing tremendous numbers in the 80s when the kelp forests recovered offshore. And sea urchin abundance, when some of our one meter quadrats would be over 100 purple sea urchins. But now, now being, I guess it started about 2010, Julie, the sea urchin population, where it used to be 60 to 100 per meter square at Portuguese Bend has gone to nothing, one or two, zero. Yeah, some, some spot zero, it's crazy. <laughs> so something, something impacted that population. Um, I, I don't know what, what the story is there. I do know that the sea surface temperatures um, have been measured all up and down the coast. And the sea surface temperature in La Jolla by Scripps has gone up 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit every decade since 1973. And they predict that that rate will actually go up even faster based on what has happened in the past two years. The sea surface temperatures along our coast have increased 
significantly. Along with this comes an increase in the sea level. And as people in Newport Harbor discovered a couple of weeks ago, this results in um, inundation of seawater at high tides. Models predict that this will come up another foot by 2050. And that's sort of a medium guess. So that will impact who grows where or who settles where in our rocky intertidal zones. And I think I'll stop. Thank you. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's a good example of, of species recovery um, and changes um, over time. So, so next we're going to uh, move on to Steve Murray and um, uh, look at kind of bigger, bigger picture things. And, and then um, we'll, we'll take some questions from the audience where we have a bunch coming in. Um, so um, Steve M, um, can, you, can you talk a bit about um, human engagement in the tide pools and how might visitors help prevent damage to the animals in the intertidal habitat, and then also um, um, wrap up with a, um, MPAs, marine protected areas, what they are and why they're important. Happy to do that, Julie. <clears throat> so I've been, um, throughout a good part of my career, <clears throat> been looking at uh, how humans impact uh, local rocky intertidal systems. <clears throat> Most of that work's been done in Orange County, but also we've worked along the Palos Verdes Peninsula. So the first thing I think it's convenient to do is to divide uh, the human presence on the shore into two categories. The first is what we would call consumptive uses. And what we mean by this is actually people coming onto the shoreline to extract or harvest or collect organisms. Um, <clears throat> this would be what would happen when people are harvesting mussels or urchins for food, collecting shelled species for souvenirs, uh, and so on. Now, obviously, the harvesting of organisms has impacts on those organisms, but it also has impacts on the other members of the communities within which they live. And these impacts really depend on how much is taken, um, how that harvesting is actually done, because it's one thing to come in and use your hands and take a few muscles, and it's another to use a crowbar and hack off a few uh, muscles from the shore. And the other part of the impact is really how big the population of the critter you're harvesting, how big that population is on the shore that you're engaged in this kind of activities. It's also important to recognize that the impacts are not limited to just the organisms that are being taken. For example, when you take a few mussels from a mussel bed, well, what you do is you wind up weakening the attachments of the other mussels to the rocks and to one another. So when the tide comes back in and wave action comes forward, uh, you wind up actually having a large number of other mussels being ripped out off of that bed uh, due to the actual extraction or harvesting of few that you might have taken. And of course, as Steve Lee pointed out, uh, those mussel beds provide habitat for a wealth of other species. So it's not just the mussels that are being affected. Now, the second major category of human engagement on the shore goes under the label of what are called non-consumptive uses. So this means people are coming down to the shore to observe, to um, um, engage in a, a, a nice sort of walk and stroll around the rocks uh, for educational purposes, uh, a variety of different ways that they use the shore without any intent 
to collect or harvest or extract organisms. Now, the most common form of this non-consumptive impact takes place by people actually walking across the rocky intertidal and stepping on organisms. A lot of folks don't realize that even though a lot of these critters are pretty hardy, that many of them are quite vulnerable to being stepped on. Uh, the name we use for this kind of uh, uh, impact is trampling. And trampling has been studied all over the world because it's a problem in coral reef habitats. It's a problem in uh, Australia on their shores. Um, a lot of information that trampling impacts organisms. Uh, it's also a phenomenon that's widely observed in terrestrial habitats like grasslands. And it occurs in salt marshes. One of the reasons why often when you visit a salt marsh, you find paths that you're to stay on as you move around through the salt marsh. Now the impacts of trampling depend on a variety of things. They depend on the species and how susceptible it is to being physically damaged by being stepped on. But it's also a function of really the number of individuals that concentrate their walking activity on the shore. Uh, it also is the area over which uh, someone might walk. If you come down and take a few steps, that's different than walking for several minutes over lots of habitat. And actually there is some care that you can use with regard to where you put your feet. Because if you walk on certain things, uh, you can create a lot of damage when you walk on the rocks, or even many of the upper shore barnacles can handle this pretty well. It's true that the higher intertidal habitats, higher up on the shore, are going to receive more visitors. Makes sense. People tend to stay dry, a lot of them. And of course, the higher part of the shore is exposed for longer periods of time. So more visitors typically up high than down low. Uh, the lower shore is particularly the species that live there. Many of them are particularly vulnerable to being stepped on, uh, particularly the seaweeds. And those seaweeds provide habitat, food resources, but principally habitat for a lot of species. Some upper shore seaweeds, like rockweeds, are quite vulnerable to being walked on. Uh, we've done a lot of work on rockweeds and trampling and have found really big changes in rockweed cover on shores subject to trampling treatments, including the loss of a lot of reproductive material. So the impacts of trampling include the direct killing of organisms, the crushing of a snail, the weakening attachment of, uh, let's say, mussels on the shore, uh, detaching organisms from the rocks, and in the case of seaweeds in particular, breaking off branches and losing reproductive parts. What's interesting is that these kinds of impacts of, of trampling are essentially unavoidable for any visitor who visits the tide pools. Even those that are just interested in observing or photography. So it's something you need to be very much aware of. Now, educational groups can exert large impacts via trampling on the shore. And this is because educational groups often uh, are large in number and concentrated in areas. So when educating, educational groups go to the shore, need to be particularly cautious and careful about where they put their feet. So non-consumptive and consumptive activities both have impacts. Uh, consumptive activities, particularly in the intertidal zone, in California, uh, are controlled and regulated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife in some way, um, either through protected areas or through regulation. Non-consumptive activities, essentially providing access to the shore, is really not regulated in most parts of, of the California shoreline. So Julie's asked me to say a few words also about marine protected areas, so I'll do that. I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, hopefully you can all see this. Uh, let me know if you can. So this is the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And one thing I just want to point out is that the Palos Verdes Peninsula 
really lies in a very interesting and unique part of the Southern California Bight, as we call it, the Southern California coast. And that's because it is this big rocky peninsula that separates uh, a large bay made mostly of sand and soft substrate in Santa Monica Bay that extends up to Malibu. And then on the down coast side, you've got a major harbor followed by a lot more sandy and soft sediment area and habitat until you get down to Laguna. So this is a really critical area, particularly for organisms that might produce larvae that need to come down and be carried by the currents and recruit elsewhere. Also, Palos Verdes needs to be fed by larvae, many of which are being carried by the currents and essentially recruiting elsewhere. Now, I did a quick calculation this morning uh, of the Palos Verdes uh, uh, shoreline, and it's about 17 linear miles if you go all the way along the coast. And this side of the coast is certainly different than this side in terms of its biology. Now, with regard to the Palos Verdes coastline, hey, Julie, are you able to uh, see this screen fine? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. So the Palos Verdes coastline has two marine protected areas. And I just wanna say that uh, the, the south coast region, which is here in Southern California, uh, has um, about, has 50 marine protected areas. And those protected areas cover about 15% of state waters. Now I should point out that when we talk about state waters, we're talking about everything from the shoreline out to about three miles, three nautical miles. Most of the area is of course offshore in terms of the coverage of state waters. And the South Coast region, uh, is one of uh, four regions, and the total number of MPAs along the California coast are about 124, uh, including mostly, mostly coastal MPAs with some that wind up being in, um, in estuaries. Now, these MPAs come in uh, two major uh, types, two major labels. Palos Verdes has what are called SMCAs, uh, the other type of marine protected area is called the State Marine Reserve or an SMR. Now, a State Marine Reserve allows no taking of any organisms of any kind, either in the offshore waters or along the coast. It is the highest level of protection that California provides for its coastline. Uh, State Marine Conservation Areas or SCMAs, however, are a little different. They allow some form of recreational or commercial take, um, or they can allow no take like the Point Vicente uh, Marine Conservation Area, but are so-called an SCM, SMCA because they do allow ongoing permitted activities. So most of the permitted activities in the PV area are essentially work that needs to be done with respect to the Montrose um, Superfund site. So really Point Vicente is equivalent to a state marine reserve in terms of the protection it conveys. Now Abalone Cove over here, the second uh, marine protected area along the California, uh, the, the, the Palos Verdes Peninsula is not a no-take marine conservation area. It does allow for um, various kinds of, of take. Most of that take, however, is for fish, such as white sea bass or pelagic fin fish species by spearfishing, squid using a handheld dip net, swordfish by harpoon, and so on. So really, the Abalone Cove shoreline intertidal area uh, is really no harvesting, no taking of, of organisms. Now, these two MPAs along the Palos Verdes Peninsula, together only protect 2.7 miles of the 17 mile uh, coastline. And of that 2.7 miles, only 1.1 of it is rock. The rest of it is more of the type of cobble and so on that you see that um, in, 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 in uh, coarse sand that you see in various parts of the peninsula. So really, if you look at the Palos Verdes Peninsula, it has very little marine protected area coverage 
along the intertidal area. So um, this means that most of the Palos Verde shoreline is not protected by marine protected areas. That means that most of the California shoreline uh, along the Palos Verdes Peninsula is subject to fish and game regulations. And fish and game does have regulations. Uh, it's a, a code, code title 14 that essentially regulates uh, size limits, bag limits, methods of take for invertebrates, uh, and it also gives some specific regulations for certain kinds of commonly taken invertebrates like clams and lobsters and so on. Uh, these regulations also prohibit the take of marine plants, principally kelps. So despite its size and key location and its key role as a rocky peninsula separating two major stretches, long spans of sandy and soft bottom coastline, this coastline doesn't really receive much MPA protection. This means that most of the coastline is simply subjected to California Department of Fish and Wildlife regulations. Um, and for that, uh, most of the harvesting that's done, if it's within uh, bag limits um, and size limits and taken with certain kinds of gear is legal as long as the harvester has a California sport fishing license. And in California, you also have to have a, a fairly low cost ocean enhancement validation. So humans are clearly uh, very actively impacting uh, the rocky shores along our coastline. Uh, these shores are changing dramatically as has been pointed out, not only due to uh, human pressures directly as visitors in the intertidal, but also from the myriad of activities that result in discharges into the nearshore waters. Uh, but they're also being changed markedly by what are very rapid changes in ocean conditions, uh, seawater temperature, nutrient availability, which is bringing about a lot of other different kinds of issues, such as an increased frequency in marine diseases, harmful algal blooms, uh, and so on. So that's what I have to say about this topic, and hopefully I've covered uh, this in a way that makes some sense to you all. Thanks, Steve. Uh, that was awesome. Um, okay, so um, thank you all for uh, your, your um, input and your um, knowledge. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come in um, from the audience. And um, the first one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to Steve Lee, because um, it's about mussels. And, and um, there's a couple of questions that are the same. So I'll just kind of summarize them. But um, there's a, there's a few people that are wondering, uh, you, you talked about the loss of muscle beds, and they're wondering if you have any idea what are, is it primarily driven by human take or climate change, longer, longer term climate factors or combination, or, or what's your sense on that? Yeah, and I'll just also say I had a massive computer uh, meltdown a minute ago, so I had to jump off for a second. Oh, I didn't even believe that other laptop is not completely dead. It went to the blue screen. Uh, anyway, so a little bit befuddled because of that, but um, but mostly, so there definitely are impacts from people harvesting the mussels out there. But, uh, and so, and I've had people while we're out there working and you know, you saw the little frame that we have, I have in that picture that showed the mussels. I've had a fisherman come right up to my frame while we were working and pull mussels right out of the plot I was sampling. Oh, um, <laughs> he must have thought that then I must have been delineating the really good ones or something. But, uh, <laughs> but, but so there, there is pressure and, and fishermen will come through and they'll, I mean, really most people aren't harvesting mussels, at least maybe until recently for cons direct consumption. There's been a lot of harvesting of mussels for, as bait for fishing. Um, and they'll take set, like a bucket full at a, at a time uh, up to. But, but that's probably not what's causing most of the, the, the cl declines we're seeing because it's happening in a widespread way, uh, way around multiple sites across the area. 
If it was a direct, uh, direct take, it would be more patchy than that. And also what's happening with the muscles, it's not that they're just disappearing, it's the size class of the muscles uh, are, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the muscles are sort of shrinking and not getting ever as big. So up here in Northern California, where I live now, on the coastline, you'll regularly go out and see muscles that are six, seven inches long in places. Um, but down there in the, in the, in the Palos Verdes Peninsula area, you know, you're lucky to get a muscle there that's three to four inches, and they're all a lot, a lot smaller than that in, in many cases. Um, so it's probably it's probably a, a physical factors or some, of some way, something uh, of some means that are causing it. And the temperature issues we've been having are the, and at least I, I would suspect, are the most likely candidate. You could also uh, say that pollution might be having something to do with it, but I wouldn't say that pollution is getting has been getting systematically worse in the area in a way that's tracking the declines in the muscles. So, you know, there are really a lot of changes happening in Southern California right now. Another thing we've not even talked about is invasive species. That's another gigantic issue that's happening. In Catalina Island, where I do a lot of research, there's a, a, a underwater, uh, I mean, a seaweed that, that grows there that has been introduced from Japan. And it's so fundamentally taking over the, the the subtitle habitats of Catalina that's almost reckon unrecognizable in places. Um, and it grows up these reproductive fronds that, fronds that, that smother all, lots of other things out. Um, again, all this stuff seems to be, like, like Suzanne said, it seems to be coming more and more like, like uh, the Mexican shoreline up here uh, in, in, in many ways. It's, and uh, and it's just most of it seems to be a temperature related thing as far as I'm concerned. But maybe Steve or, or Alan or Suzanne have a different uh, take on that. Jenny, you guys want to comment on um, the loss of muscles and, and why? Yep. I, I agree with what Steve is saying. Combination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, there's, there's a, a bunch of questions about abalone. <laughs> um, <laughs> Abalone are near and dear to everybody's heart, right? So um, um, I'll leave this for Suzanne or Alan or anybody really that wants to, um, I'll just kind of combine them. There's a lot of people asking is, is there a way, is there a way to, to, to raise abalone and, and plant them um, back? And um, is there any, is there any, um, relationship with the, the loss of black abalone and climate change? So it's kind of um, different questions, but. Yeah. Um, as far as raising abalone, that is being done quite extensively, except that black abalone in particular are, are terribly difficult to, to, to deal with. I don't think anybody's been successful in, um, trying to spawn them in the lab and, and raise young, but, uh, but that is done very regularly nowadays with red abalone. And for many years now, uh, Fish and Game and, and other entities have, have uh, transplanted abalone back into, into the ocean. That's uh, going on with white abalone. Um, Cabrillo is involved with, with that, as well as, as other uh, public aquariums, raising the young and then eventually they get transplanted back out into the ocean. Uh, but black abalone are, are particularly difficult to deal with. Nobody um, has been successful at, uh, at having them reproduce in the lab and, and you know, um, raise the young. So it's a challenge for some of our aquatic nursery people if they can find any black abalone to work with. Right, first you gotta can get I make the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Can I make a comment on that? Uh, yes. So th I, it's, it's really easy to just go complete doom and gloom when you're having discussions like this. But I also wanted to say that with respect to this topic, there actually has been some good news up at, at, that there have been with the red and the green, or the, uh, the pink and the green abalone, especially the greens, uh, out at the, in Catalina again, that the populations, there's been a big effort by Department of Fish and Games, uh, CDFW, to, to to help that spe those species recover out there. And we've been tracking the abalone and with subtitle surveys for years and years out there at the, and around uh, the Wrigley Marine Lab, Catalina. 
And there's, there's been some really, really great recovery out there. And some, there's times where I, we can go out on a single dive and count well over 100, uh, you know, uh, red or, or pink or green abalone out there. And yeah. so, so there are things like that, 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 that where there are recovery success stories. And, and, and those species of abalone um, are starting to show some promise mm -hmm. in that regard. Um, I'm just going to share my screen while the next question comes up, because, if that's okay. Because yeah, of course, of keep course. talking about black abalone, I think it just might be fun for people to see, again, what it used to look like. Um, and so you can let me know it when that comes up. <laughs> yeah, we could see it. Wow. Those are okay. What was this, Steve? <laughs> that's San Nicolas Island. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah there, that's what it used to Yeah, there's Before the withering foot syndrome happened, this is what it was like when I first started sampling, doing intertidal samples, at, sampling out at San Nick back in the early 1990s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's it. I'll stop sharing. I just wanted to share that picture. That's amazing. It does look like rocks. Well, there are a couple of questions that people are asking about. Are, are, are you guys seeing um, the same similar changes on the islands as well as on the breakwater as we are on the mainland intertidal? Hmm. Hmm. I, mean, Steve, um, I, 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 I can answer that question in part. Okay. I, I, I think that... <clears throat> So, so things, things are changing. And I think that those of us who have studied these systems for a while realize that they don't stay static, that they do change and there's a lot of natural change that occurs. Um, the islands have a lot more of a, um, of, of, of intertidal communities that show fewer signs of being disturbed. And disturbed is a broad term that we use, but um, there are certain, certain indicators of disturbance. Um, high abundances of articulated coralline algae, crustose algae, reduced abundances of foliose seaweeds, um, and you see some losses of some of the larger shelled invertebrates or reduced numbers of them. The mainland, particularly from Santa Monica Bay, um, down and around through the upper part of Orange County, is particularly uh, indicative of disturbed, disturbed intertidal habitats. Uh, we see that readily. Um, so the rate of change, I think, uh, has accelerated greatly because of some of these major events. So I'll throw a screen saver up here real quickly or share a screen here that is also gets back to the abalone piece um, that we just talked about uh, a minute ago uh, because I have a photo here in the lower right. Uh, this is on San Clemente Island. And um, this was a place that people weren't getting to at all. It's an, Navy military island. So the loss of these black abalone, now there are none, um, was largely attributed to this withering foot disease, which really was devastating, particularly for, for black abalone. Um, basically, the poor abalone cannot process the food that they eat, and so they wind up digesting their own muscle, which is their foot. And ultimately, their foot shrinks to the point where they can't hold on to the rock. On the left is uh, an indication of what Alan talked about uh, more recently, the sea star wasting disease. So this photo here on the left of the, of, of the um, Pycnopodia, the big uh, uh, sun star, this is the same rock on the left and the right two days later. Because this disease, when it comes in, just literally devastates uh, the sea stars. Now, because these sea stars are voracious predators, when you take them out, change is gonna occur. When these abalone are gone from these rocks, change is gonna occur. So we have a lot of change that's occurring. And I think that the mainland is, is a lot of the change on the mainland occurred earlier. Um, Probably the most significant changes along the Southern California mainland, and this is 
just an opinion of mine because there are no data to really um, quantitatively address this, occurred before the, the 60s. Um, because change has been clearly prevalent, but a lot of the things that there are indications were present in the 60s and 50s and 40s just weren't there by the time we got to the 70s and 80s. And you can see this in museum specimens where you have folks collecting from the intertidal habitats and depositing large shelled mollusks. Um, you don't see those anymore when you go down to an intertidal habitat. So I would say the islands are in better shape than the mainland. The mainland, particularly in the more central part of the Los Angeles region, it has more disturbance indicators than as you move farther out. Uh, but change is occurring in all of these places, and it's accelerated. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask this one to Alan. Um, and it, it's a, again about recovery. Um, but someone wants to know a bit more about other species. Like uh, if we were able to slow the take of mussels, sea urchins, whelks, snails, et cetera, at, at White Point and Royal Palms and other local tide pools, will the area recover? How long will it take recover to recover and what is needed to aid in its recovery? Temperature is a biggie and um, most people are fully aware of why the Earth's temperature has been increasing and substantially in the past decade, if not what we've had the, the warmest global temperatures almost every year for the past four years repetitively. Uh, so temperature is associated with the diseases that have impacted the abalone and the myriad species of sea stars. It apparently reduces their ability, their physiological abilities and their immunity. And so viruses which are present, but in low numbers and not doing anything terrible, now aren't being defended against and the wasting diseases take over. Uh, what do you do about I have no clue. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, some other species, uh, I saw somebody had a question about uh, the owl limpet, Laudia. Mm -hmm. So the owl limpet, when left alone, the females can reach a uh, size of four or five inches. Yummy. And I had a student that was working with um, Laudia, the owl limpet, uh, up on the coast here <clears throat> near Lonata Bay. And he came down one day to work with his population. And there were a group of people sitting around having a picnic and they were just popping these limpets off and consuming them. So those are herbivores like the abalone. And um, Steve points out that you get uh, this coral and algae that moves in, or well, it doesn't move in, it expands, let's put it, it's, it's there already, as an indicator of uh, disruptive activities. Uh, I remember the early days um, at White Point when there were black abalone feeding on the bacteria that were growing around the uh, hot water seeps, the thermal vents that are, that are there. But uh, all that's just changed. And Steve's point about a changing baseline, the baseline has been changing for decades and really only started to get data on this in the, in the 60s. And then of course, all of us, in the 70s and 80s and continuing on. So it's it's just all very interesting. That's all I can say. Okay. I can add one more point to that, if that's okay, which is that it, it, it does depend on the species, the answer to answer that question about 
how the recovery can work and be a little bit easier with some species than others. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Just for an example, there are certain species which are broadcast spawners, which reduce their larvae, uh, their, their sperm and eggs into the water, and then the larvae, you know, they get fertilized and the larvae go out in the water column and then they drift around for a while and then they come back on land by chance when the currents change. And then that's how settlement occurs of new individuals. There are other species that are brooders that, that, that hold their, their, um, you know, their young very close to them. And abalone are one of those examples. And so when you have larger and larger amounts of space between the individuals, when you have brood, brooding populations that um, rely on very close uh, fertilization, uh, close proximity for fertilization, fertilization, it, the recovery after there's a population dieback for those types of species becomes harder than for the broadcast spawners. So that's just another piece of that uh, answer to that question. But there's also the situation where uh, some studies with the black abalone have indicated that recruitment occurs from um, larvae locally. That's where most of the recruitment happens, which can explain why there's so few black abalone found along Palos Verdes now, is there's not, as Steve mentions, a brooding density. And so the black abalone are dependent on the few larvae that make it from mostly the Channel Islands now. Yeah, and some other species like um... Uh, it's, it's been my observation that Pisaster, the, the ochre star, uh, you, you don't see very young uh, ochre stars very often. You see them once, once in a great while and usually at headlands after a storm had, uh, had passed through. So it, it's, it seems like maybe the larvae are be, being brought in from longer distances. It's just there's not a steady reproduction of new ochre stars going on from from what I've seen. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we are uh, almost out of time. Um, and I want to be respectful of all of your evenings and your time. But um, I guess one last question um, to, to Steve Murray, uh, again, about um, mar marine protected areas. Um, can you just kind of in closing, um, again, just reiterate the importance of them and um, are, are MPAs enough protection for our rocky intertidal habitat? Is that, um, uh, uh, you went over it so quickly. If you could just kind of reiterate that and then, and then we'll end it with that. Well, I think we all need to realize that California has really taken a very unique position in establishing a scientifically planned uh, network of marine protected areas throughout the state. In fact, it's being copied in other parts of the world for its uh, uh, efficacy and its uniqueness. Uh, the marine protected areas can do a very good job, particularly if they're large enough and if they're positioned, spaced appropriately, so that larvae from one are able to seed uh, a down coast area in another. And that's how California's MPA system was planned. So these are really valuable, important tools, spatial tools to manage our coastal systems. Um, Southern California, there could be some improvements, particularly around the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Um, that did not go as it should have. Um, uh, and I think everybody realizes that. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on uh, users, for users to um, put the MPAs where they wound up. Uh, and as a result, you know, the PV shoreline is not very well protected, uh, nor are some of the shallow water near shore habitats. Uh, there are things that people can do, particularly local communities, and um, um, there's a, a collaborative group that uh, revolves around uh, citizens revolving around trying to uh, work together to um, um, engage in activities that promote MPAs and um, uh, uh, do some docent work and, and other kinds of work to help uh, educate folks. Uh, there's also um, 
cities and governments, particularly in Orange County, that have taken some nice steps towards um, trying to get their local law enforcement trained in CDFW code and asking them to go down to the shoreline and cite people who are vile in violation as a means to provide a presence, to also produce uh, um, a, a docent system to provide education on site. And many years ago, the city of Laguna Beach actually hired a marine protected area person, a, a shore person, uh, to help organize a lot of that activity. So there are things that local government can do that augments the state's efforts. But marine protected areas are very valuable tools and hopefully they will pay off for California in the long run. They already are in some cases. Okay, well, um, I, that's, I think that's it for tonight. We're just over eight o'clock. Um, so I would uh, like to thank all of our panelists. Thank you so much uh, um, for your time and your expertise and um, agreeing to be um, on this panel and doing this webinar. And um, I'd also like to thank, thank again our partnership between USCC Grant and the Kabrooman Aquarium. And to all the listeners, we apologize if we didn't get to your questions, all of the questions. There, there were a lot of them coming in, but just know we've collected them all and we're gonna try to um, answer them and we hope to address them um, more at future meetings. And once again, the second panel will be on August 26th, um, also at 6.30 p.m. and it will be about management, policy and enforcement in the Rocky Intertidal. The third panel will be on September 9th, also at 6.30 p.m. Um, and it will be on the intersection of people and the Rocky Intertidal. More information about that and how to uh, log on to get the links are both on Cabrimen Aquarium and USCC Grants websites. And just a final reminder, if you see inappropriate activity in the tide pools, really the best thing to do is to call CalTIP. Know the regulations, but call CalTIP and uh, let them deal with it. So uh, thank you again to everybody for joining us and um, have a nice night. Good night.